Thank you everyone for coming to our session on migration and inequality in low and middle income countries. We have four papers focusing on uh, migration, inequality, environmental conditions and natural resources in developing countries. This session was sponsored by CWAE and international section. Uh, without much ado, we're going to get started with Aniola Fasola presenting on distribution policy on social cohesion in South Africa. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so my name is Eniola Fashola. I'm a third year PhD student at Department of Agriculture and Resource Economics, University of Connect Court. I've been working on this project for almost about a year with um, my one of my advisors and uh, Professor Professor Jorge, and it's just about traditional policies and social cohesion in an on high unemployment setting. So I'll just start. Okay, so basically um, our motivation is when you compare South Africa with other neighboring countries, um, such as Mozambique, Zimbabwe, Namibia, Lesotho, um, or other countries in the sub-Saharan region. And one of the things you will notice is that the GDP per capita um, of South Africa is quite very high compared to every single one of these regions. And so because of this and certain post-apartheid um, policies, there's been an influx of refugees and asylum seekers, as well as possibly displaced um, individuals from across different parts of the world um, and ac across neighboring countries as a result of humanitarian um, crisis, um, political crisis, um, and most of them are moving towards South Africa. And um, it, was, it was literally seen by the United Nations um, High Commission for Refugees in 2020, that between 2008 to 2012, the country received um, the highest number of new asylum applications worldwide. We could see from the graph that in 2008, there was this really, really high rise in applicants um, wanting to come to South Africa. And um, so basically right now, I believe Syria and Venezuela have a really large influx more than South Africa, but despite still, um, South, Africa, South Africa still remains a major destination hub for a lot of um, forcefully displaced individuals across um, the world. Okay, so um, first of all, a research was done by Sid um in around 2013, um, whereby it looked about it looked at um, the authors looked at um, the World Value Survey, and one of the things they tried to do was to look at the the attitude towards immigrants in South Africa, and they looked about the time period of between 2001 and 2007. And one of the things they realized that between that time period, there was a decrease in favorable views towards immigrants in South Africa by 10 points, which was about 23% of the total population in South Africa. And um, so based on our own data set, um, we used um, two major data sets. Um, but this is the South African um, South African Social Attitude Survey. Um, we looked at um, the time period between 2008 and 2017. We see that in 2008, for example, there was a favorable um, views towards immigrants. But by 2009, um, we begin to see, or 2010, we begin to see a decline um, in the views towards immigrants across South Africa in general. So another motivation for our study is the unemployment issue. Um, despite South Africa having a very, very high um, GDP per capita um, across the world, when you compare um, it with other countries that have similar GDP per capita, have similar economic development, one of the things you will notice is that um, South Africa has a really, really high um, unemployment rate, really, literally one of the highest um, unemployment rate across the world. And so basically, we, when looking at every single one of these things, the influx of refugees, the influx of asylum seekers, the high unemployment rate, um, one of the questions we try to ask is, um, could distributional policies such as a cash transfer program um, promote social cohesion? Could it reduce um, social conflict and could it make the attitudes towards immigrants um, better in general? Since one of the issues is that um, people are coming in and um, there is unemployment rate as well. Okay, it's just a quick um, summary about our study. 
Um, the question we try to find, we try to look at the impact of an unconditional cash transfer program, um, known as the South African Old Age Pension, um, currently known as Old Age Grant. I'll talk more about that later on. And so our question is that, can the cash transfer policies provide an effective tool to um, reduce anti-immigration attitude? Could it um, promote social cohesion? Um, could it reduce social conflict in a like, refugee hosting um, setting and one with high unemployment rates, such as South Africa and in other regions? And so how do we do this is that we obtain um, data sets from, I mean, data set is South African um, social attitude survey, and we focus on Blacks and colored um, mixed race South Africans. And um, so basically one of the things that we see is that um, there is an eligibility criteria for receiving the holded pension, which is um, by 2010, currently by 2010, um, once you are age, once you are about age 60 and above, that's when you are eligible. And there's other, other criteria, but we see a probability of receiving the holded pension continually jump um, around the um, age criteria. And so because of this, we employ a foresee um, regression discontinuity design in our approach in this particular study. Okay, so basically the main result um, is that, um, I'll talk more about this later on, but the main result is that the whole age pension um, has a positive but literally no significant impact on social cohesion. And um, we see that the pension increases recipient life satisfaction, meaning that, you know, they have an increase in well-being, increase in income. Um, there's a positive attitude towards um, racial diversity, but there's really no major impact on attitudes towards immigrants in general. Okay, so a quick thing about the old age pension. Um, so this is actually a large, a really large um, transfer grant that is given to um, South African um, citizens and permanent residents. Um, this is about um, 1,890 rands every month um, for older adults. So for example, this is quite large in South Africa because for those that are non-eligible around the same age group, um, this is about um, 1.4 to two times the amount of the, the amount of median household income for those that are not eligible around the same age. And so for the eligible rules, um, first of all, they have to be age 60 by 2010, the age criteria was age 60 and older. They have to be South African citizens. They have to be permanent residents. And also um, for a particular year, they must not earn more than, if you're single, they must not earn more than 86,000 rands. If they're married, they must not earn more than um, 172,000 rands. And also there's also a limit to the assets, um, the asset the process, whether they're single or they're married. Um, okay, so basically, the, there's a lot of ample literature that has been done about the impact. For example, Esther Duflo um, looked at the impact on the on um, the height and weight of girls, of those that their grandmothers received the um, old age pension. Um, there's been also been, been the, there's a few other people also have looked at the impact on labor force participation. Um, there's also been other people that have looked at the impact on mental health. Um, the impact on, on changes on school enrollments and several other things in general. So one of the things we should know is that the old aid pension in South Africa is not the only welfare grant provided by the South African um, government. We also have the child support and care dependency. We have the four-star child grants, the grant in aid, the war veteran grants, the ability grants. But Every single one of these particular grants um, do not meet the eligibility criteria um, that relates to the whole aid pension. Um, but in terms of the war veteran grant and the disability grant, one of the things is that they, they meet this particular criteria in a way, but um, they cover just a very small percentage of the whole population in general. Okay, so what okay, so what is really novel about our study? Um, the first thing is that um, our time horizon, which we look at um, the time range between 2008 and 2017, enables us to look at the changes in age eligibility that has not been used in previous studies. So, for example, in 2007, um, women were eligible at 60, men were eligible at 65. Um, 2008, women were eligible at 63, men at, sorry, women were eligible at 60, men were eligible at 63. Um, 2009, women were eligible at 60, men at 61. 
but by 2010, everything was standardized to 60. So this was not considered in previous studies, but in our study, we tried to, um, we incorporated this particular changes. And um, the second thing is that the outcome, our outcome focus on something that impacts the society, which has not really been looked at. Um, looked at in previous studies, most have just looked at, you know, how it impacts the beneficiaries or their families. And also, we also looked at, um, we also implemented the recent development in regression constant design, um, whereby other prior studies had not um, taken into account the fact that the assignment um, variable or the running variable was a discrete, um, was discrete in nature, which we looked at also in our study. Okay, so basically, um, in terms of the role of cash transfer, um, so why would old age pension, a cash transfer pension, right, reduce xenophobia? And um, one of the reasons we've seen over the years um, in literature is that a reason for xenophobia or like fear um, towards immigrants is that there is competition in the labor force. Um, for example, maybe people are thinking of citizens and the permanent residents are thinking the immigrants are coming to steal their jobs or steal the jobs of the natives. Um, so that means that if, for example, people receive cash transfer, for example, cash transfer given to the poor citizens in the country, um, what could happen is that, I mean, as a result of them having an increase in income, right, they, they don't really have to struggle a lot in the labor market. This could reduce the negative attitude um, towards immigrants and could potentially increase social cohesion. Um, a prior work had shown that the old age pension um, decreased the labor force participation, um, participation whereby the men, um, for example, there was decrease in labor participation for men than women. And so this showed that as a result of people receiving the pension, they were leaving the labor force. So they most likely are not competing for jobs for the immigrants, right? So now the answer is like, okay, do we really see this in our research, right? Is this really what is happening as a result? Um, So other arguments, for example, um, is that there could be a scenario whereby um, there is the, the effects, there's really no effects, right, of the cash transfer, whereby the effect of this large government transfer um, could be reduced, even if poverty is a main driver. And um, this was shown in previous studies whereby um, public support um, programs have been shown to displace um, crowd out private support. And, Several research has shown that those that receive the okay, thank you. Um, several research has shown that those that receive the pension right um, receive lower income from their families or children. Um, the other argument also shows that there could also be a non-effect if the main driver of anti-immigrant immigration um, sentiments as a result of non-wage factors, um, maybe language barriers, historical triggers, crime, and things like that. So I have really limited time, so I'm going to go through very quickly. Okay, so um, the data sources we use, um, we first use the general household survey. Um, this basically used the same um, multiple rounds from 2008 to 2017. This was basically to check our, um, the validity of our identification strategy. Um, then we moved to the South African social attitude survey, which was our main data set, whereby we're able to look at various, um, about 100 variables, grouping them into various dimensions of social cohesion, from attitudes on immigrants, interpersonal trust, satisfaction with government, life satisfaction, preference for racial diversity. Um, this is a similar survey that relates, similar with um, the world value survey, whereby I mentioned social, political, economic values of people. Um, so basically this is our um, identification strategy, um, whereby the first stage we look at the probability of receiving the old age pension given the age. Um, then the second stage um, where SCI is the measures of social cohesion and we control for fixed effect by province of residence, um, by survey year and also control for gender and race as well. Okay, so first of all, um, in this particular first stage, one of the things we see, for example, um, running it across all the several welfare grants, for the old age pension, you see that um, the probability of receiving the pension as a result, the probability of receiving the pension jumped discontinuously from zero to 60%, right, at the cutoff. And for the welfare grant, we don't see um, the similar jump um, but for the disability grants, we see there's a little jump, but they'll see they take 
operate is really um there's a discontinuous jump and takeoff is really really low um but yeah okay so the major results we have um is first of all that um the impact on of the old day pension on social cohesion right small right it's not significant um this is about 0 0.0 um seven one seven um deviation at the cuts of age um we also see this is quite similar for the attitudes on immigrants interpersonal trust but one of the things we just see for example is that the older pension old age pension usually increases some um, life satisfaction increases racial diversity but reduces um social participation and this will explain as a result of an increase in welfare gains in general um also we um looked at because the previous um bandwidth we used was about the bandwidth of 10 and um, we did certain robustness check as well to look at smaller bandwidth is the bandwidth of three and we see similar patterns um as well then um there's a lot going on in this but this is just all the variables on the attitude towards immigrants but the main ones that are really statistically significant is, um, for example, they feel that government should welcome immigrants. Um, but apart from that, there is really nothing going on here. Then also we look at heterogeneous effects, um, heterogeneous effects and see how, what are these changes as a result of the flow of asylum seekers and refugees. And we see that this is still the same thing. Okay, so the summary of our, all our um, paper, all our, every single thing we did was that there is a positive or insignificant impact on social cohesion. Um, the results are consistent with net gains in income and well being, which shows that, which was shown by the increase in life satisfaction and attitude towards racial diversity. But this increase in well being doesn't really translate into interpersonal trust, um, trust institution, or satisfaction with the government. And so one of the things we explain from this is that the anti-immigrant behavior are not as a reason, reason of labor market competition. They're not as a reason of um, as a reason of um, low income levels of poverty. Um, so one of the things we explained was that they are basically based on non-wage factors, historical triggers, ethnic backgrounds, and you know language barriers. Thank you very much. Um, have a lot of robustness check, but this is just. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so uh, for the text of the text. I was curious for the 60 and over population that you're interested in, mm -hmm. is uh, is the are the social cohesion and levels of welcoming immigrants is, is it low is it high is this in that population is that something so it's that's a concern um so yeah it's um it's something that is a concern so the attitudes towards immigrants is the same across different ages in south africa it's not like um it's more towards the youth but it's across even the older people <laughs> I'm thinking about whether it's possible to discover whether, like, I think most immigrants are not competing with this whole group. Mm -hmm. Instead, they're more likely to be competing with their child. So, is that possible to assess, like, uh, at the year when their child is, like, after the graduation or, like, whether this kind of difference will, you know, provide some instead of this kind of you know, pension program itself. Okay. Okay, yes, we can consider it. But one of the things we looked at is um the fact that a lot of times um research has shown that um people once they receive the cash transfer, they are younger, uh, maybe their children or grandchildren come to live with them because they feel they have money. So there is a sort of influence on those younger ones as well. So um but we can look at what you mentioned. Yeah. Thank you for that suggestion. Sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question. 
Now, have you looked at like the historical mechanisms uh, that looking at the labor market transformation uh, or resources or children uh, that might explain? Okay. Uh, effects on time computers. Okay. Um, more of a sort of effects on muscle distribution. Okay, um, we have not done that personally, um, but other studies have done that, um, whereby they mentioned that the participation reduces. For, for this program, yes, yes. Yeah, they've done it that um, there is a reduction in labor um, first participation, but we personally didn't do that, which is thinking. Thank you. If there's any question on Zoom. So, okay. Oh, we can move ahead. Thank you. Um, okay, we can take the other questions at the end of the uh, presentation. So we'll move on with our next uh, presentation. That is by Jimena from Stockholm University. And she'll be talking to us about uh, temperature shocks and migration in El Salvador. Uh, can you habilitate um, me sharing the screen? Yes, you can, you can share your screen. Uh, I cannot do it. You cannot do it. Let me see if I can. I think I did that. Um, this is just what is showing. Can you try again, Jimena? Mm -hmm. It says it's disabled for uh, screen sharing for participants. Yeah, try it out, please. Okay. Aha. Can you see it? Yes. You're all okay. set. One second. Okay. Hello, everyone. I will be. I am Jimena Romero, and I will be presenting responses to temperature shocks, labor markets, and migration decisions in El Salvador. And I would like to start with this graph of the evolution of mean surface temperature uh, in the globe across the, the across 100 years. And as you can see, there has been an increase in the variability and wavelengths of heat, of heat uh, in the last uh, years. And it has come along with an increased frequency of extreme weather events uh, around the country and in is felt uh, in different countries, including in El Salvador, that has been subject of three extreme droughts in the last 10 years. In 2012, we had a drought that reduced agricultural production by 70%. Between 2014 and, 20, 2014 and 2015, more than 100,000 fa farmers suffered from another drought. And in 2018, uh, there was a new drought that struck the country before it had even recovered from the previous one. So what we want to study is the response to temperature shock in El Salvador. And we want to measure the effect of extreme temperatures on agricultural production of corn. And we're focusing on corn because it's a major staple uh, crop in the country. In our data, between 80 and 90% of our uh, house uh, farmers uh, produce corn and it's also a major source of calorie intake and product production. And we find that there is indeed a negative effect on total production. Second, uh, we look at adjustments through local labor markets uh, and international migration. We find that there is a reduction in the labor demand of agricultural workers and in hourly wages. And we want to look at these adjustments through the lenses of heterogeneous effects by land ownership and access to risk copying mechanisms, such as access to migrant networks and remittances and access to financial markets. Um, okay. So with this uh, study, we're contributing to three major strands on the literature. Um, first, we had to the work on migration responses to weather shocks and natural disasters. And the literature finds usually the negative weather effects, including natural disasters, increased internal migration and immigration. And we've also listed the literature by using microdata, which allows us to identify the adjustments farmers and agricultural workers take, especially through labor market as a consequence of temperature shocks. And thanks to this, we can identify more fine grain policy recommendations. 
Second, we provide evidence on how negative temperature shocks affect agricultural productions in developing countries specifically, and how incomplete markets may pressure households to rely on migration to countries without the falling income. And third, we contribute to the literature on the consequences of climate change and the adaptation strategies used by households, even though we focus mostly in short-term effects and we do not consider long-term strategies, we are providing some evidence on the potential adaptive responses of farmers to increasingly frequent weather events. And we can see here how climate change, which is caused globally, affect countries in, affects households in developing countries that uh, may seek refuge in, when possible in developed countries. So it is a shared global responsibility. And then a little bit of context, uh, by 2017, 30% of the working age individuals in El Salvador were living in the US. So it's a country with a high migration rate. It's a country that is highly vulnerable to weather shocks. As I said, it had three major droughts in the last 10 years. And it's a country whose agricultural system is mostly of subsistence and is highly dependent on the rain cycle and weather elements. 87% of agricultures are, are small farmers and only 1.4 of the land is irrigated. Uh, the data that we use is mostly two major uh, household services surveys. The first one is an agricultural survey done by the Ministry of Agriculture from 2013 to 2018. It's cross-sectional and representative at the national and regional level. From here, we take agricultural production outcomes and labor demand outcomes. And here we have a sample of around um, 19,000 19, agricultural product producers. The second is a um, household survey of general purposes uh, from 2010 to 2018. It's also cross-sectional. And uh, from here, we take migration and labor outcomes. These are also representative at the national and regional level. And our main independent variable, it's uh, taken from NASA's MODI satellite data uh, from 2010 to 2018 of uh, one kilometer grid resolution and uh, eight day average per grid. And we pull this information to the municipality level. And we create a high temperature shock um, variable, which is a number of hot weeks during the agricultural season primera, which is in June and July at mm -hmm. the municipality level. And it is hot if the temperature is to standard deviations above the historical mean. And we're focusing in agricultural season primera because it's the main harvest season in where most of the crop is being produced. And because the agricultural survey is taking after this season, so it's more precise to take this information. And as you can see, the, our there's a lot of variability in temperature shocks. You can see that there's a lot of variability in the annual mean of temperature in El Salvador. And here you can see our variable of number of hot weeks in Primera. And it is um, changes a lot between municipalities and between years. 2015 was a specifically hot year. Uh, and we do some robustness tests by taking out this year and still our results are significant and, and robust. So um, with this data, we want to test different hypotheses. First, we test if a temperature increases, if temperature increases reduce agricultural production, uh, agricultural yield uh, per hectare and total. And we've run a, a specification of, uh, we have our dependent variable, which is the logarithm of crop yield uh, of the agricultural producers I in municipality J in GRT during Primera. And we run this with a number of weeks of uh, with temperature shocks in the in Primera during that same year. We add controls at the producer level, such as uh, household heads, age, gender, number of household members. We add controls at the municipality level on weather and crime, such as heavy rainfall shocks, drought shocks, and crime shocks. And this is estimated with the homicides per capita per, capita per municipality. We have municipality fixed effects, year fixed effects, and we also interact uh, municipality conditions with a linear trend, baseline municipality conditions such as poverty, um, number of uh, proportion of uh, population working in agriculture, uh, immigrants, um, uh, even elevation. 
and we cluster the standard errors to the municipality and year. So we indeed find that there is a reduction in uh, uh, agricultural yield of 5.4% per hectare and 2.8% in total production. And this gives some hints that there is also an adjustment through the use of land, which is very similar to what Aragon found in Peru in 2021. Second, we see if given these uh, falling crop yields, farmers are just to protect their agricultural profits and, uh, and smooth consumption. And we do these adjustments through, and is these adjustments occur through the labor market. And we find that there's a lower demand for agricultural workers and a substitution between higher and household workers. As you can see, uh, higher workers fall in 2.9% um, when there's a temperature shock and there's no effect on household workers. We also find some evidence that there is an adjustment through the use of agricultural inputs. There's a reduction in the use of chemical agents used in pulp harbor activities, and there's an increase on the land allocated to corn production in 1.7%. And so given this um, income fall uh, in agricultural workers, we study if they compensate by adjusting either wages and hours relocate to other sectors or migrate. And we do this through the lenses of heterogeneity by land ownership. And this is because landowners are very different to non-landowners. Uh, landowners, they can set the wages, which can work as an insurance mechanism when they are in complete financial markets. And they can substitute the demand of higher workers with domestic laborers. Non-landowners, they will face the demand, they will face the fall in demand and wage offers and may or may not relocate to other sectors more easier. And we find indeed that uh, in non landowners, there's a fall in the productivity of working, in the probability of working, but there is no evidence of relocation to other agricultural sectors, um, to other non agricultural sectors so far. And we see that landowners do experience an increase in working hours and a reduction in uh, hourly wages. Now, we also test if there is a, try to see if there is an effect through migration. And here we um, take migration as the probability that a member of the household migrated during the survey year. Uh, we run a similar specification than before. The only difference is that now we are lagging our temperature shock with the year previous because our survey does not allow us to identify exactly when during the year the household member migrated. We just know it migrated during that year. So we are lagging it to be sure that they have been exposed to the temperature shock. And we find that indeed there is a, 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 an increase uh, in the likelihood of migrating when exposed to a temperature shock of 20.1% 20 20 to the mean among agricultural households. And in non-agricultural households, well, there is no effect. And so now we want to see if this effect on adjustments through labor markets and migrations um, is uh, dependent on access to risk coping mechanisms. And we expect that if there are no risk coping mechanisms, the effects may, uh, will transmit more directly through the labor market and there will be a fall in wages and more reliance on migration to compensate for this falling income. If there is access to risk coping mechanisms, we expect that this effect does not transmit as much to the agricultural labor market, and so there is less reliance on migration. Uh, looking at the labor markets, we indeed see that there is a um, reduction in, there is a more pronounced effect and statistically significant in those households that are in municipalities with below the median share of migrants at baseline. And this is an indicator of uh, access to migrant networks and remittances. And so if they are in areas where there is less access to these uh, risk coping mechanisms, there is indeed an effect in the labor markets. In those um, households that are, in, that are above the medium share of migrant populations, we do not see uh, any impact in, in lab through labor markets which this may provide some suggestive evidence that there is uh, access to risk coping mechanisms through access to remittances, which allow them to, to go with a falling income instead of migrate. Second, we look at the impact of migration and we found that 
there is indeed an effect uh, and the evidence is in line to what we expect. The impact on the likelihood of migration is higher in regions with a lower share of migrants and therefore remittances. And in municipalities below the medium of migration, we found that one additional standard deviation of the shock increases migration by around 26.6%, whereas those that are above the median, so have more access to, to migrant networks, uh, the effect is lower of 13.8%. And this can suggest that receiving remittances might help to alleviate the negative temperature shock and stay in the place of origin. Uh, in addition, we also found that credit constraint uh, households or households that are in municipality with less access to credit are more likely to migrate. In municipalities below the median on access to credit at baseline, one additional uh, standard deviation of temperature shock, shock increases migration by around 40% related <laughs> to the mean, where it's only 11% in municipalities with higher access to credit. And then we just ran a series of robustness tests to to see if um, uh, 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 how robust are our results. <laughs> uh, we find that we, we only find effects using the main harvest season primera, which is what we are expecting. And we also find that it is robust to use in different periods of years. As you can see, this is robust by excluding the extreme year 2015 and also other range of years. And our effects are mostly significant during winter shock or primera, which is during June and July. We also make a placebo test and we permutate the temperature shocks a thousand times and we find that the effects are very unlikely to occur due to chance. And we also <coughs> look at other plausible mechanisms that may be affecting our results. So they are robust with or without controls of violence or crime shocks. And we see that the results are driven mostly in rural, in those households that are in rural areas and not in urban. So this is with and without a crime shock in the column one and two in rural areas and in columns three and four in urban areas. So to conclude, we find that there is a negative impact of extreme temperatures on agricultural production. As we have seen, there is a fall in total production and total productivity, as well in total factor productivity. Uh, we find that <coughs> agriculture labor is caused by contracting uh, labor demand for higher workers. And they also reduce the use of other inputs, in particular post-yield inputs. And there was also an increase in the land employed. We also uh, find that labor markets work as a transmission mechanism of negative water shocks, but, and the, but it's important to look at this through heterogeneity on access to uh, land ownership and risk coping mechanisms like financial markets and remittances. At last, we find that agricultural workers do respond by migrating internationally. Uh, an additional week with a temperature shock increases um, international migration by around 25% in those cultivated territory crops, and it is much higher in municipalities with low access to credit, which is around 55%. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jimena. Are there any questions? Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna say something because the people online. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to see us, but I do want to say something here about the paper. I think it's really interesting. And one thing I'm really curious about is sort of the people that are moving, whether it's men, women, sort of what age groups um, are they respond? You know, I really care about sort of how migration is affecting women in this day and age. And I'm curious if a lot of the people that are moving are sort of being attracted to the domestic sector in the United States. And also it's sort of symbolizes not only a loss of TFP because of crop productivity, but, but potentially a loss of GDP if you have a substantial portion of the labor market sort of leaving El Salvador. Um, so I'm sort of curious more about who's leaving um, and, uh, you know, what, what do we know about who's leaving? Who, who are the ones that are sort of taking the hit to protect their family from the shock? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um... 
we don't have the data for that. We just know it's somebody on the household migrated and which year was the most recent. But we can do some analysis on the household characteristics uh, of those that have a household member that migrated. It's a bit tricky because if um, more than one person migrated uh, at the same time, then we may not have complete information. But yeah, I... Well, I, I wonder... I wonder if you could do something, uh, I don't know how, I, I have to think about this more, but I wonder mm -hmm. if you could sort of inter interact what's happening on the receiving end. Uh -huh. So we like don't... if it changes in the domestic sector in the United States sort of are, do you see that um, the coping strategies are going up or down to pace, depending on labor demand characteristics, like how the domestic sector might be changing or how wages on the domestic side at the receiving destination might be changing that might tell you a little bit more about who's moving yes the only thing is that we don't know exactly where to the us we know that 90 around 95 percent go to the united states but we don't have that exact destination we can do some shocks by time and we're trying to do something about like um it's like openness of laws to migrants per time, but the problem is we cannot see exactly where in the US they are going. Uh, but yes, I, I, I completely agree that it will be more interesting to look into who is migrating or what kind of household have more migrants. We know where they are like in the, in the origin place. So that's why we're doing this heterogeneity by place of origin. Uh, and then looking at the household, we have the tricky question of we when we do the survey and they already migrated and we don't know if we have one member, maybe three already migrated that year. So it's hard to know exactly how the household was before migration. But I think it's a really good point to, that we should explore more too. Thank you, Jimena, and thank you, Valerie. We'll, because of the interest of time, we are going to move on to the can I take the question at the end of the session? Yeah, thank you. So because of the interest of time, we are gonna move on to our next presenter, who is Juliet from University of Minnesota, telling us about the relationship between pollution and uh, population growth. Uh, Jimena, if you could stop sharing the screen, please. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, good morning, everyone. Um, so, uh, today I'm presenting a paper as uh, uh, we already mentioned about population growth and environmental uh, quality or environmental damage. And there is an official version of why we started this paper and an official one. So, I will start with an official one so that I can introduce my co authors. So, Minoru, uh, we worked together a few years ago. Uh, at the IDB, and then he knew me. He knew Pablo, who is here uh, seated on, uh, on the on the uh, room. And he said, "Like Pablo, you have good, uh, nice data. Juliet, you have nice data. We should merge data sets and, and see uh, what goes out of that." So uh, what we are showing today is work in progress, and I have to clarify that. Um, and comments are very welcome because we just started this project. Okay. Um, with that said, with that said, the official reason why we are doing this paper is because we want to know what are the effects of population growth. Um, of course, we already know that population growth would cause uh, many issues. For example, increased consumption, increased production, and in turn, that would, that would go to uh, increased pol pollution. Um, and pollution is one of the most uh, of the biggest problems right now, and it's causing it's caused partially because of humans. There are also other causes, but we are trying to look at what happens uh, if population grows with, uh, with pollution. What is the relationship between those two variables? And this topic, it's very important because um, every year, because of pollution, there are uh, uh, increasing issues with health uh, among, among many peoples. And uh, the World Bank reports on two, reported in 2016 that about 5.5 million deaths were caused because of environmental damages in general. Um, but the, the, the problem with this, with investigating this type of, of issues is that where can we find 
exogenous sources of population growth. And that's where migration go, uh, comes into place. So migration uh, has been increasing over the past uh, several years. Um, it is right now in a, a 9.3 million are either forcibly displaced or migrated, um, and it has increased a lot uh, in the last 10 years. Um, most of this migration goes to uh, developing countries, so 85% of those, of those migrants are right now in developing countries where pollution is a serious problem. So if we go, if we check uh, PM10, which is uh, one of the variables we're using, the particular matter 10, uh, which is an indicator of pollution, what we see is that India is one of the uh, countries that is producing um, most of this particular matter. Uh, uh, Colombia is above the US, for example. So this is an issue. Pollution is an issue that is going on uh, a lot in developing countries. And on top of that, most of the migration is also going to developing countries, okay? And we have uh, this, this event in Colombia particularly, which is where this study focuses on, which is that recently in 2016, there was a huge increase in the number of immigrants from Venezuela to Colombia. So uh, uh, right now, Colombia hosts uh, 1.8 million Venezuelan immigrants uh, that mostly come from an unexpected shock from Venezuela. So let's talk a little bit about this uh, immigration to see why this is important, an important, an important exogenous source of variation of population. Um, this migration uh, it's, it's huge in terms of the population. It's 3.6% of Colombia's population and it's 7.2% of, of uh, Colombia's labor force. Um, Although in Colombia, it has been usual that there has been, uh, because of the internal war, uh, internal migration, it is very rare that the international migration happens. So this event in 2016 happened uh, because of some political issues that we'll, I will explain later on, and uh, increased the population of, of immigrants in the country by a lot. It was, it was uh, and it was basically um, uh, accelerated by the increased economic crisis and because of the policy of Colombia, which is a, an open, open door policy to any type of immigrant. Um, however, when we study this topic, one of the most important issues is where do migrants settle? And that's one of the questions that we um, try to answer here. And it's because official records offer a partial picture of where migrants are settling. Uh, mostly because, because uh, even if the government of Colombia has implemented some censuses, um, there, is a, there is a voluntary nature of registering in those, in those censuses. So about uh, one half of Venezuelans in Colombia, although they are, not, they are welcome in the country, uh, they are currently not documented. So the, country, the, 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 the government doesn't know where, where uh, they are. So what we do in this paper is that we evaluate the effect of um, unexpected pollution growth due to an increased immigration in Colombia um, on pollution and on two, area, on two variables that are key, which are a particle matter 2.5 and particle matter 10, which are um, measures of, of pollution. Um, and what we do is first to understand uh, the, the situation of Colombia, which is uh, migration started in 2016 and, and peaked in 2018. So we identify where migrants settles using, using two strategies. The first strategy is to use the intensity of keywords that Venezuelans and not Colombians used. So for example, uh, Venezuelans in uh, the word for the work permit that, they, the, that the government issues for them, the PEP, among other variables. And that's the way we identify where they are settled. And the second way we identify where they're settled is through Facebook logins. So uh, Facebook has this nice data set where um, if you created an account in, for example, Venezuela and you travel to Colombia, then uh, they can locate whether you are an, a foreigner or not. And uh, we use this data set. We also obtain, um, on the, on the environmental side, we obtain data from PM 2.5 and, and, and PM 10. 
um, which are data coming from satellite data and pollution monitors respectively. So 2.5 comes from satellite data and 10 from pollution monitors. And we use a difference in differences design to uh, evaluate what is the effect on immigration. Uh, of course, there is uh, lots of issues with uh, measuring migration and any other variables. So we also use a, an instrumental variables approach as uh, the, usual, the literature usually uh, handles this, which is with that chief chair. Um, our findings, our preliminary findings, I have to say, uh, are the population growth uh, has increased um, uh, 2.5 between uh, the particular mark 2.5 uh, that often comes from motor combust combustion, power plant combustion and industrial places. And the size of the effect is between a 0 0.4 and 1.4% for every 1 percentage point increase in population, in the shared population. So that's a pretty high, uh, high significant effect. We don't find effects on PM10, which often comes from smoke, dust and dirt. And uh, something that is not here, but uh, this effect of PM 2.5 usually happens where there is more, more in, in municipalities with more income or with higher production. Um, okay, just briefly about the historical events. There are three political events associated with increased migration in Colombia, but uh, most of them have to do with a political issue between Colombia and Venezuela. They closed the border and for a period of this net migration, for a period, um, net migration was around zero, but after 2016, as you see, there is the first spike of net migration being positive. And then there are two other events that um, also make uh, lots of immigrants from Venezuela go out of, out of their country into Colombia and other countries uh, in South America. Um, so very briefly about this, uh, this uh, idea, there have been uh, papers investigating what is the effect of population growth on the environmental. This mostly comes from simulations data. So what they do is to create uh, what would have happened with population growth under certain uh, scenarios and compare uh, using, using simulations. Uh, recently, there is an increase in uh, causal evidence on environmental damages due to migrants. So there is this example by um, uh, Colette Salemi, uh, who studies how immigration in camps, which are is a particular type of migration, right, like forcibly displaced, um, are affecting uh, deforestation because these new camps are maybe affecting uh, the, surround, the surroundings of uh, the surrounding nature. Um, but we don't know the effects on urban pollution yet, uh, at least costly, or uh, we have not found uh, evidence um, about the data. So we have data on pollution, as I said, uh, we have 285 municipalities. We have data, monthly data from 2010 to 2020. Uh, we dropped 2020 because of the obvious reasons. So we are using uh, 2010 to 2019. And then we use uh, PM10, uh, which is particularly Mother 10, uh, uh, and match municipalities uh, for all the pollution monitors in a 30 kilometer radius around the municipality. This is the data set that actually Pablo used in, her, in his job market paper. And uh, PM10, the usual sources of this particular matter are uh, smoke, dust, and dirt from ancient road construction, landfill, agriculture, pollen, mold, uh, space heaters, crushing and grinding operations. And the other data comes from Hammer all 2020. It's uh, a 2.5 and it comes from satellite data and mostly comes from motor combustion, power plant combustion, industrial processes, stoves, and fireplaces. The difference between 2.5 and 10 is the size of the, of the particle. Basically, uh, PM5, it's more dangerous for, for humans because it's smaller and it's more likely to go deeper into your lungs compared to PM10, which is larger. Uh, and it goes also to your lungs, but it's not as dangerous as 2.5. Okay, so it has also, it may have some um, health uh, consequences as well. 
Um, so this is like I said for for areas with high migration versus areas with low migration. So overall, the the behavior of both uh, PM two point five and PM ten are pretty similar in both types of, of areas. We are not using a dummy. It, it was just for this exercise, but we are using a continuous variable about the intensity of migration because of these measures uh, by um, using Google Google searches and, and Facebook. Okay, faster. <laughs> so migration, I've already talked about this. So basically uh, migration uh, comes from Facebook. Uh, we have data from 2018 to 2020 per municipality monthly. So we aggregated uh, to, to understand uh, where, where Venezuelans were located in 2019. Internet searches, we have it after 2016. So we also aggregated to know where migrants are salary. Both of those measures do, uh, give pretty similar results. Um, and for robustness checks, we also use uh, household surveys and censuses, um, but I will go faster. So uh, this is the, the measure between uh, the measure, the share of immigrants according to household service and according to fa Facebook logins, what you find is that Facebook logins captures better migration, the same as internet searches. So overall, uh, while official record says that one in three Venezuelans are located in Bogota, the capital of Colombia, Facebook says that, uh, or sorry, this is this Google searches says that one in five immigrants are located in Bogota. So that's how uh, you um, realize that these official records are not capturing the whole territory, but are focusing on, on big cities just because this is how a uh, household service work. Um, okay, going to the uh, identification strategy, we use a different difference in differences approach where we use uh, PM10 as well as P, uh, PM2.5 uh, for each municipality at each month. Um, and we use as an explanatory variable, the number of Venezuelan immigrants as a share of the local population. So uh, we interpret this in terms of percentage points and we control for temperature range and interaction between those two terms and uh, GDP per capita. Um, the main assumptions of course are parallel trends and uh, that those are not, uh, that there is no reverse causality, reason why we use an ID. Um, do there are uh, uh, significant differences between municipalities with high migration versus municipalities with low migration, which is expected and also uh, handled by the difference in differences models and, and through the IV. Going to the results, we find uh, on the event study that there is no much difference between municipalities with high migration versus municipalities with low migration in terms of changes in pollution. And, but when we turn into the difference in differences model, we find a small change, thank you, uh, on uh, PM 2.5, but we find nothing for PM 10. Uh, when we interact this by GDP per capita, we find that a, an increase in one percentage point in, uh, in the number of immigrants as a percentage of the population, will increase pollution by 4.7%. Uh, so that's quite sizable. And then for the IV, uh, there are uh, opposite results, again, positive for 2.5, uh, negative uh, for PM10. Um, and the final remarks uh, before wrapping up. So what we find is that population growth seems to increase PM2.5, which is, again, the most dangerous uh, pollutant because it is smaller, that often comes for, mo for, for motor combo combustion. Um, and what we find is that each additional percentage point uh, of growth in the population uh, increases these levels by between 0 0.1 and 1.4%. Sorry about that. Um, and there is a larger increase in areas with higher economic activity. We are still working on why uh, there is a negative effect on PM10. Uh, but mostly after uh, several robustness checks, um, we find that PM10 remains stable. Uh, it means there is, there is no significant change. 
Um, but for sure, these are short-term effects. So we are not sure because the immigration happened in 2016 and our data set goes up until 2019. So we're not sure what the long-term effects are. Um, thank you. <laughs> I'm wondering how you identify like people who are those immigrants to the place. Is it based on the like the search record before they come to country or after or at least or you have certain ethnic people being there? Can you see like whether those area that already had like immigrants come come to that like based on those search record will like have uh, gain like a larger increase in the search after this country might be like, I'm not sure. So yes, yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so these searches usually happen after the crisis because when because when the happen when the sorry when the crisis happened took place in 2016, the government implemented work permits. So part of the searches that uh, that we use is uh, searches of employment of the employment permit, and this employment permit did not did not exist before. Um, the other type of searches is uh, like Venezuelans in, which is uh, similar to communities, uh, but also those happen mostly after the crisis started. We don't have data before, uh, and the same for Facebook. Facebook started collecting the data after the crisis started, but not before. So we just have after data of where they settled after the crisis, but we don't know where, where they were, uh, if the if, were the immigrants that were already in Colombia, were located. We know that uh, you're seeing the census of 2005, but and there is a long period of time between 2005 and 2016, so we are not sure what happens before the crisis. Yeah. Is there any question on, on online? Ah, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I don't think so. I'm not sure how to look at it. No. Thank you. Yeah, th thanks, Juliet. So we'll go to the final presentation, which is mine. And uh, Juliet, if you could please ah, keep the time. Sure. Thank you so much. Um, so hi, everyone. So today I'm going to be presenting my work with Valerie Mueller at Arizona State University. This project is looking at resource trap and child well-being in Zambia. So there, it is documented that resource boom affects economic growth at the aggregate level and also at different levels of ge geographical resolution and across different sectors in the economy. It has also been documented that resource boom affects income per capita, population growth, employment patterns, and health spending. There's also not a literature that documents the negative impacts of natural resource boom because of presence of market frictions across the globe. However, the distributional effect of these resource boom across different demographic groups are less studied. To be able to leverage the right policies, it is important to understand what are the distributional effects of uh, such natural resource uh, boom. In this paper, we focus on the copper boom in the 2000s. So if you look at the graph on the left-hand side of the slide, where I plot uh, the international copper prices in US dollars from the year 1990 to 2020, and you see that there's a sharp increase in copper prices after the year 2003. In this paper, we focus on Zambia also for a couple of reasons. Zambia is a country that is heavily based on copper mining and 60% of the exports from Zambia is copper. And out of the total copper exports in Africa, 70% of them comes from Zambia. Lastly, 45% of Zambia's revenue is attributed to copper mining. With this background in this paper, we focus on adolescent girls. And we particularly ask the question, how did the copper boom in 2000s affected girls between the age of 12 and 18 in this following dimension. We first look at educational outcome, that is how school attendance have been impacted. Second, we move on to think about what are the employment effects of this resource boom. So thinking about how paid and unpaid work has changed uh, after the 2000s. 
We also look at marriage market uh, among these girls and also whether they're having more children post uh, this uh, resource board. We also explore the heterogeneity in these outcomes based on a couple of uh, dimensions. The first thing is we look at whether children who are primarily educated, whether they have a different uh, response to this copper boom compared to those that have not. Second, we focus on liquidity constraints. That is households which are richer behave differently than those that are poorer. And lastly, we explore the norms and cultural practices revolving around labor market and marriage market in Zambia. To speak a little bit more about the mechanisms and how we can think about copper, uh, any resource boom affecting human capital investment. So any positive income shock could direct basic consumption towards physical and human capital investment. At the same time, it raises the opportunity cost of education because now employment is attractive. There is also evidence on gendered consequences of pattern of investment due to con consequences in the marriage market conditions and bright price. There is also, there could be also implications on substitution between family members in terms of paid and unpaid work. Moving on to talk about the data sources in the study, uh, there are a couple. The first is the data source for the mines, which comes from a global platform called Mining Intelligence. This Mining Intelligence data set uh, covers global data on all mines. It has geo-coordinates of mines, the uh, accounts for the minerals and metals produced in each of those mines, and also the volume of production in those mines. The second data set that we use is the IMF commodity prices data set. Uh, this data set has annual uh, price for primary commodity across the globe, and it comes from the year 1990 to 2020. It also has the price index, price levels, and annual changes. Lastly, we use the international IPOMS data for Zambia. This is a repeated cross-section of household data for the years 1990, 2000, 2010. This data set records information about uh, education, employment, industry, skill sets, and household amenities, among other things. So let me walk you through my uh, identification strategy. So our level of geographical resolution for this data set is at the constituency level, which is the third level of administrative division. We construct the centroid of these constituencies and assign the households that are located within that centroid, sorry, within that constituency to that centroid. We calculate the distance between mines located in Zambia for the year 2000 to the, the constituency centroid for all households in Zambia for the two years 2000 and 2010. We implement a simple regression where the left-hand side is attendance in school, and the right-hand side is a bunch of dummies for different distances from the mine. For example, 0 to 10 kilometers, 10 to 20 kilometers, 10 to 30, and so on. And what we find is that in this graph, we plot the coefficient on the distance dummies. And what we find is that the effect is significant up to 30 kilometers of a mine on school attendance. And that effect becomes insignificant beyond that. Based on this, our uh, treated and con controlled constituencies look as follows. So if you look at the map of Zambia, the red dots or points in the map are the location of the mines, which is located mostly in the copper belt region in Zambia. And the blue shaded constituencies are our treated constituencies. The light green shaded constituencies are within 30 to 100 kilometers of the mine, and they are our control constituencies. The dark green shaded uh, uh, constituencies are our, uh, we use that to do sensitivity analysis as a secondary control group. And the gray shaded part of Zambia is outside our study sample. Moving on to talk a little bit about how the sample looks like. So we focus on adolescence girls between the age of 12 and 18. Among these girls, around 60 to 80% of them attend a uh, school. They are also involved in paid and unpaid labor. Around two to three percent of them do paid work, whereas around five percent of them are engaged in, in unpaid work. 
there's also around two to three percent of these girls getting married. To talk a little bit about the households to which these girls belong, the proportion of working adults who are married in this household is around 60 to 64 percent. The dependency ratio, which is the ratio of number of kids below the age 12, plus the number of seniors above age 65, divided by the total number of working population, that is the age between 19 and 64, that ratio is around one for both the rounds. The unemployment rate in, in these constituencies are around 10 percent. Around 20 to 24 percent of these employed individuals work in the manufacturing sector. Around 48 to 49 percent of them are in the services. The rest are working in some other industry or in agriculture. Among these working adults, there are around 50 percent of them primarily educated. Moving on to talk about my empirical specification. So we use a definitive specification. Um, let me walk you through my specification. On the left-hand side, the dependent variable is an indicator for whether the girl attends school or not. We use a same regression for a bunch of other variables, that is, whether they engage in paid work, unpaid work, their marital status, and whether they had a child last year. We include constituency and your fixed effects. And then the variable MD denotes whether the household is located within 30 kilometers of a mine. And PD denotes an indicator for the for post copper boom. So for the year 2010, it takes values value one. And for 2000 round, it takes value zero. We also control for household level variables. And those include proportion married, the number of working adults who are primary and secondary educated, and the unemployment level in that constituency, and also the industry composition in those constituency. So the proportion of working age uh, individuals employed in manufacturing services, and also the skill composition of these working adults. The standard errors are clustered at the constituency level at which we define our main treatment variable. Here, our primary uh, parameter of interest is gamma, which captures the effect of being located within 30 kilometers of a mine, as opposed to being located within 30 to 100 kilometers post the copper boom. Moving on to talk about our primary main results. So what we find is that if you focus on column one, we find that uh, school attendance has reduced for kids who are located within 30 kilometers of the mine. And uh, this effect is around 10% at the mean. We also find an increase in paid work. And there's also an increase in girls getting married if they're located closer to the copper, uh, copper mines after the copper boom. And there's also is evidence about these girls having children in the last year. Next, we move on to talk a little bit about the mechanisms and how these differ based on education level of the girls and the households they come from. So if you focus on uh, columns two, three, and four, you will see that there is a reduction in unpaid work for girls who are primarily educated. And there is an increase in marital uh, status irrespective of their primary education. Next, moving on to talk about liquidity constraints. So the way we construct or think about liquidity constraint is thinking about the number of working age adults. So we use the variable where we construct the number of kids below the age 12 and the number of seniors above the age 65 divided by the total number of individuals between age uh, 19 to 64. And what we find is that households that have a higher uh, number of dependents are more likely to drop out of school if they're located within 30 kilometers of the mine compared to if they are staying further away. We also find an increase in paid work of these girls closer, located closer to the mine and also an increase in uh, them getting married. So the recurrent theme across all these results has been that there's a reduction in school attendance, but there's also an increase in marriage and some amount of labor market participation. So to move further ahead and think about the marriage market for adolescents in, in African countries, 
So there is a large literature on social norms revolving around marriage markets and their implications. So let me talk a little bit about the marriage market in Zambia. I take much of the data from the ethnographic atlas. So there is a, a practice of the land being inherited through the matrilineal lineage. That is that girls and girls in the household inherit the land. And this gives them some bargaining power in the marriage market. In my sample, around 77% of the ethnic groups practice some kind of uh, uh, matrilineal inheritance. Secondly, the transfer of residence after marriage is that is the tradition is that the groom moves to the bride's house post marriage. Around 76% of the ethnic groups are involved in this kind of matrilocal arrangements. And lastly, almost all ethnic groups are involved in some sort of bride price arrangement. So here, the girl, the, the groom pays a girl in, in, in case of marriages. So we further look at heterogeneity based on whether there is difference in inheritance law, whether that at all affects the people, the girl's child's impact on school attendance, work, and marriage. And what we find is that in, in households where there is a practice of matrilineal inheritance, that people drop out of school and there's also an increase in uh, marriage market. And this provides some kind of suggestive evidence that this gives the girl child the bargaining power to, uh, to probably ask for a higher bride price. Lastly, we also look at whether this matrilocal arrangement post marriage has an effect, and we find kind of similar results. So we see that households engaging in matri uh, matrilocal arrangements and are located within 30 kilometers of the mine are less are more likely to drop out of school compared to those living within 30 to 100 kilometers. And there's also also an increase in paid work in the, in these places. And I also find that, in, if you focus on the last column, that there is an increase in marriage of these individuals. So to conclude, in this paper, we analyze the effect of resource boom on human capital investment. In particular, we find that resource boom reduces school attendance among young girls between the age of 12 and 18. It increases paid and unpaid work for them as well as there is marriage market outcome for these girls increases. And there we find also there is some kind of heterogeneous effect based on education and wealth of the households. And because of the norms revolving around marriage, we see this stark evidence in the marriage market outcomes in Zambia post the copper boom. As a next step of this project, we want to uh, explore more about the labor market dynamics we want to see whether there has been shifts in labor market dynamics after the copper boom. So thinking about whether there is more job creation after the copper boom closer to the mines and whether these jobs are more women-centric jobs that are pulling these girls out of school to employment. And we also want to explore more whether there is substitution of paid and unpaid work within the household members uh, after this copper boom whether girls are getting involved in some kind of work which the parents were doing before, so on and so forth. Um, thank you for listening. Yeah. 2003, three onwards. So that that's an excellent point. So the thing is, we uh, my survey data is from two thousand and two thousand and ten. So if you look at the price difference between two thousand and two thousand and ten, you will find an increase in the copper prices. So if you look at the people's response for 2010, that is after the copper price has increased. Does that make sense? Yeah, but like, if you find that, like, the, the starting point that I think all the like, behavior change of the format or like, household that must be you know, after they observe their like, 
and that has been year 2003. I don't think they were observed. It's just like if we look at we look back to the data, we can have it starts at, 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 at after 2003. But I think at that point, no one is expecting this kind of thing. And so it's it's your result, right? Being sensitive to the to view you choose. Uh, the short answer is not because my I observed the people in 2010. So even if I think you can think of the price change between 2000 and 2010. So if you if you take the difference of copper prices in 2010 and 2000, there's a sharp increase. So even if I say that copper prices started increasing from 2003, there's a gradual increase. But I don't observe the sample in 2003. If that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. That, that's a very interesting point. This, this is a very much work in progress, and we are going to think about that. But at the moment, we have constituency fixed effects, which takes somewhat into account if there's any kind of conflict at the constituency level. But uh, we have not really explored deep into whether there's some kind of other conflicts that is leading to uh, these results. Um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you for your suggestion. Yeah. So I am using, so we have data for two rounds, 2000 and 2010. And we are using the, we are basically using the post variable, which takes values one after the copper boom. We could technically substitute that for prices, which would be the same thing technically, just would have a different interpretation for the coefficient. You have that one uh, treatment, treatment is equal to one investment is pretty kilometers within the mine. Yeah. Uh, but so that is just a distance from the mine. Yes. So, uh, so it's the prices. So you're saying that the closer your distance, if you are within 30 kilometers radius, uh, then, uh, then you're treated kind of, you know, in the treatment. So it's the, the classic defender framework. So we are comparing the people who are located within 30 kilometers of the mine with 30 to 100 pre and post boom, copper boom. Uh, and that pre and post copper boom is basically taking into account the price difference for the so households that were surveyed in 2000 as compared to the households that were surveyed in 2010. Yeah, but we just yeah. to use the price and use like some sort of should share mechanism where we use the national uh, export price and then use the so that's an extra variation that you can use right? but you are, I guess you have only two times this. Yeah, actually, yeah, that, that's uh, that's a great suggestion, and I think you answered the question. The main downside is we have two survey rounds, so it, it's a little hard to use that uh, that that uh, strategy. Um, yeah. So, uh, I'm a little concerned about the calculation of the kind of choosing the treatment group and out and the you know, uncertainty around it. Um, so the the iTunes is just giving you like some kind of municipality of residence or it's not giving you a, G, a, a GIS for different houses. They're not. So the, we have, you have the province, then you have the municipalities, then you have the constituency. So we could, the best we could have done is the constituency centroid and mapping to the households. Yeah, they, those are not the perfect measures, but uh, you can still think of households that are located close enough to constituencies that are closer to the mine, as opposed to those are, that are further away. Yeah, we can also do, I'm sorry, yeah, go ahead. They, I mean, you're, you're potentially comparing people who is, so, someone potentially could be in the treatment group and farther away from the land that somebody would control. I mean, because it's just the, the nature of the, the data you have, you can't really. So, I mean, one, one thing I think that would be, and I'm guessing that if you get a referee on this, they're going to be concerned about this as well. So, what, one kind of way of, of trying to think about this is just the, you know, dealing with through, through the standard errors and through kind of simulating a little bit of the 
that potential problem because it's going to just depend on the nature of the data and where those you know constituencies are and how far they are from the mines and you know where the kind of households might be so you could potentially essentially run this as like a placebo in space where you're, you're really just you know okay what could be the potential uncertainty here if we cut the data this way run the bigger effects and kind of do that kind of some time so you're trying to actually say you know hey is this, is this a really like a, a problem or not or that's a great suggestion like do kind of kind of sensitivity tests based on how we are signing out treatment and control uh groups basically the other way we thought of like assigning to your control treated constituencies is just like thinking about where the mines are in those constituencies but we thought that this is a better approach but uh this is a great suggestion and we'll definitely try thank you uh it is uh i don't have that on top of my head but it's possible because the mines are very concentrated in the copper belt region and there are around 11 mines in our sample and I believe uh, it is possible that there are two in one. Yeah, you could also use that as like intensity to treat. Yeah, those are those are great suggestions. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming and uh, listening to us uh, in this session.